Hi everyone, um, I'm sharing my screen now, I hope you can see it. Um, my only regret is that we're not in a room together because it's a lot more fun telling you these stories face to face. Uh, but with a bit of imagination, I think we can get around that. So I want you to quietly pick a number from one to three. Now, I usually start by unrolling a very long tape measure, a bit like this one, and asking for three volunteers. So if you did do what I just asked you and chose a number, that means you volunteered already, and that was very kind of you, thank you. Ones, uh, you'd be joining me at the front of the room, standing facing everyone and holding the beginning of the tape measure. Threes, you're holding the wind-up reel at the end. Now, I want to imagine we've unrolled it four yards. Two, as you can stay in your seats for a while, we'll come to you in a minute. But what we've created here is a physical timeline. Ones, you're all fossils, I'm afraid, but you are rose fossils, so I hope that's okay. <laughs> rose fossils have been found dating back nearly 40 million years. Roses only grow wild in the Northern Hemisphere. There are around 150 different varieties of wild rose or species roses as they're known. Most have five petals. North America has 35 native rose species. Uh, twos, we're going to make you stand up on the line now and I'm going to give you an inflated red flintstone club to hold. Now let's assume our number three friends represent today. I'd like you all to put your finger on the screen where you think the first Homo sapiens, the first Fred and Wilma appear on this timeline. Hopefully you've put your finger in the right place there. We're comparative newcomers, just 300,000 years old. On this four year yard timeline, that's about an inch from where we are today. So roses are a lot, lot older than human beings. And looking at some of our politicians today, I like to think that we're still evolving. <laughs> Boris, Fred, who knows? Uh, let's, uh, this area here, that's I was just mentioned earlier, that's the area of the planet where all the species roses come from. And I think we should have a look at some of them. We could start with an American one. Uh, this is the Virginia rose. It's one of at least two American roses, confusingly called the prairie rose. It was the first native North American rose to be cultivated over here in Europe. In their encyclopedia, Charles and his wife Bridget call it the best all-rounder among the wild roses. Uh, this is the white musk rose. The white rose here, sorry, is the musk rose. It has a strong scent and contributed that characteristic to many of the early cultivated roses. The deep pink rose eglantine is also known as sweetbriar. And if you rub its leaves, they smell of apple. Shakespeare twinned the musk rose and eglantine for Titania's bower in Twelfth Night. And the light pink rose is the dog rose. It was called that because it was believed the roots could cure the bite of a mad dog. They can't, but it reminds us that roses have been used for centuries in medicine. Native Americans used all parts of the rose to treat everything from head colds to stomach worms. In the Northwest, they put leaves from Rosa Pisacarpa in their moccasins to treat athletes' foot. In Europe, Gerard used them as a laxative, and even today, herbalists use them. Rose water is mildly anti-inflammatory and antiseptic, so it's used to treat conjunctivitis, for example. Roses have also been used in cookery for centuries. A Roman legion on campaign in Gaul once mutinied because they were issued with wine that hadn't been flavoured with roses. One of the earliest recipe books in history is the Dere Culinaria, written in the 5th century AD by Apicus. It features this rose recipe and you might like to try it. Nice looking, isn't it? Yes, pulverize some rose petals, mix them with a broth, strain it through a colander, beat in eight eggs, some wine oil and a bit of a pepper. Sounding okay so far. Just one last ingredient, four calves brains. Let's start a new timeline. Now, if you were with me, I'm afraid once you'd be now having to wear this poor thing. So you're probably grateful that we are on a webinar. Uh, this new timeline is on a very different scale. Apicus is 1600 years ago. Before we were on 10 million years to the yard. Now we're 400 years to the yard. 
let's fast forward to the 16th century. If they weren't eating roses, then they were using them as a deodorant. A French hygienist in 1572 wrote, to cure the goat-like stench of armpits, it's useful to press and rub the skin with a compound of roses. Actually, in this period, it wasn't just the practicalities of washing that got in the way of personal hygiene. After the Black Death, many considered water simply opened the pores to contagion. It was deemed safer to keep your clothes on and give your pits the occasional wipe with a dry perfumed cloth. Queen Elizabeth here boasted that she bathed once a month, whether I need it or no. Let's move forward again to the middle of the 18th century. This is a good starting point for looking at how our modern roses really began to take off. And I hope what's noticeable here is how close we're edging to the present day, even on this new scale. One of the great early books of gardening is by the English botanist Philip Miller. Miller was the chief gardener at the Chelsea Physic Garden. I have a copy here of the sixth edition of his abridged gardener's dictionary. It's dated 1771, the year of his death. Miller names 22 main types of rose, but he goes on to say that there are a great variety of double roses now cultivated in English gardens, most of them being accidentally obtained from seeds. These improvements were spontaneous, but gardeners, when they spotted them, preserved them. Miller names 23 of these double roses. So roses are intermingling. Travellers are bringing roses from different parts of the world. Sports are appearing that have special features and gardeners are propagating those roses, but it's slow progress. Let's just have a look at a few roses from Miller's time. This is the red rose of Lancaster. Gallica tells you it's originated in Southern and Central Europe. Officinalis means it was used by apothecaries. The Puritans brought it to America. They say it's red, but if you look at it in the flesh, I think you'd say it was probably really a deep pink. This is one of the most important of the double roses available to Miller's readers. The damask rose came from the Middle East. It was allegedly brought to Europe by crusaders. In the 16th century, a variant was discovered in Italy that repeat bloomed. It became known as the autumn damask, and the man said to have introduced it to England sometime before 1513 was Thomas Cromwell who some of you know will went, went on to become King Henry VIII's bruiser and organized the dissolution of the monasteries. For a long time, the autumn damask was the only rose in England known to flower more than once in early summer and autumn. So let's have a recap. 1771, Thomas Miller here, 45 named roses in Britain. Today, 250 years later, Charles's Encyclopedia of Roses offers over 2,000, and it's estimated that across the world, there are well over 30,000. It's only in the last 250 years or so that roses have really taken off. And I'd like to look at four things that I think helped transform its development. Let me introduce you to a French postman called André Dupont. Actually, Dupont was the chief steward at the Palais de Luxembourg, looking after the brother of King Louis XVI. The obvious problem with working for the French aristocracy in the 18th century, and you may already have anticipated this, was, <laughs> yes, they got their heads chopped off. But even before the French Revolution in 1789, there was an issue. They might be the richest people in France, but they could take a year to pay their staff. Dupont was smart. In 1780, he took on a second job for the post office, where he enjoyed the useful perk of free postage. You'd have thought the man would have been too busy, but in 1785, he leased a plot of land close to the palace to nurse a fledgling passion for gardening. During the revolution, he kept his head down and more usefully on. This is a rose sometimes attributed to him. In 1796, Dupont decided to build an école or school of roses, a collection of all the known specimens. He began making the most of that free postage, swapping roses with fellow collectors and nurserymen in the Netherlands, in England and Italy, and growing roses from seeds, each sown that had been cross-pollinated by the wind and insects. Still very random, 
but we're seeing here the very start of roses being scientifically bred. In 1799, while her husband was attempting to conquer Egypt, as you will, the Empress Josephine went house hunting and bought a chateau on the outskirts of Paris called Malmaison. It's estimated that she bought as many as 1,500 roses from Dupont for the Malmaison estate, though accounts show that, guess what, she'd take at least a year to pay. She bought from elsewhere too. From North America, she bought Rosa Kalina and Rosa Setigera from French missionaries in Canada. She had a supply from England. Famously, during the Napoleonic Wars, the Royal Navy blockaded French ports, but ships were allowed through to deliver roses from a nursery in London to the Empress for her garden. The ruling classes in those days thought the rules didn't apply to them. Not like today, eh? In 1814, we know that Dupont had 537 different roses. So we've gone from 45 in 1771 to 537 in just over 40 years. Josephine engaged the talented Belgian artist Pierre-Joseph Redoute to come and paint her plants. He started in 1813. The following year, Josephine died of pneumonia. Redoute carried on painting and produced three volumes of hand-coloured engravings, more than 250 beautifully painted roses. Redoute includes some Chinese roses that began arriving in Europe from the 1750s, and there are four really important ones. First on the left here is Slater's Crimson China, with its striking red, a proper red, which arrived in 1791. It was found in Canton by Gilbert Slater, the director of the East India Company, who was astonished by its crimson colour. Old Blush, or Parsons Pink on the right, flowers all year round under glass. I believe this is the only one you can still buy today. It later found its way over to the States into the garden of a rose-loving rice planter from Charleston called John Champney. Around 1811, it crossed with the musk rose and produced a pretty pink rambler seedling they called Champney's Pink Cluster. He gave it to one of his neighbours, Philip Noisette, who was superintendent of the South Carolina Medical School's Botanical Garden. Noisette harvested the hips and developed his own new variety, Blush Noisette, a repeat flower. Noisette sent the rose to France where his brother Louis, a nurseryman in Paris, used it to create a new class of roses, the Noisettes. So Champney's Pink Cluster is an important rose in American rose history. But let's get back to Redoute. Next up, Hume's Blush, which smells of tea, which started being seen in the county of Hertfordshire in England in 1809. Botanist John Dampier Parks brought the one on the right, Parks Yellow, a tea scented rose home from the East India Tea Company Gardens in China in 1824. These Chinese roses brought new scents, new colours, and they were all repeat flowering. They could be tender, and there will have been many gardeners who paid a lot to show one of these roses off to their friends for a year, only to see it die the next. But mingled with European roses, that problem could be overcome. Breeders suddenly had some really strong material to work with. Imagine being an architect who's been able to use only wood for centuries. You could have different types of wood, but just wood. The arrival of the Chinese roses was like being told you could start building with bricks and glass and steel. But you still needed to know how, and you needed to have a market for your new buildings. You had to be able to get the materials and for them to be cost effective. And that's our next story. We've got to Redoute in 1820. Roses are getting better and better. The number of available to gardeners is growing, but they're not the most popular of plants still. In England, auriculas and plants were still more popular. The rose needed some evangelist friends, and what better person for the role than a vicar? The chap here, here you see, is Samuel Reynolds Hole, a vicar from Cornton, which is a village about 20 miles from where I sit today. Hole is worth a webinar in his own right, but I'll just mention him briefly this time. My favourite whole story is how he was invited to judge some roses at a pub in Nottingham one year in the 1850s. He claims to have known nothing about roses at the time, 
and was transfixed by what he saw. They sent him home with a bunch and that was it. Samuel Reynolds Hole had caught the rosebug. Many of you will know the feeling. You plant your first and before you know it, your garden is rammed with them. Your partner's asking what happened to the lawn and you're still wondering whether you might squeeze in another. Hole was a great writer. He's the person who best captured for me the way the rose overtakes you. Here's him writing in his book about roses published in 1869. Year by year, my enthusiasm increased. My roses multiplied from a dozen to a score, from a score to a hundred, from a hundred to a thousand, from one to five thousand trees. There came into my garden a very small band of settlers and speedily, after the example of other colonists, they civilised all the former inhabitants from off the face of the earth. They routed the rhubarb, they carried the asparagus with resistless force, they cut down the raspberries to a cane, they annexed that vegetable kingdom and they retain it still. In truth, Hole had caught the rosebugs some years before he met those Nottingham growers. In 1858, he persuaded some of the Britain's best rose breeders to organise a grand national rose show, the first ever. On the day of the exhibition, Hole was nervous. He was worried that they'd spent more than was perhaps prudent. Would the public endorse our experiment? Would the public appreciate our show? There was a deficiency of £100 in our funds for the expenses of the exhibition were £300. And as a matter of both of feeling and finance, I stood by the entrance as the clock struck two, anxiously to watch the issue. No long solicitude. More than 50 shillings, I humbly apologise, more than 50 intelligent and good-looking individuals were waiting for admission and these were followed by continuous comers until the hall was full. A gentleman who earnestly asked my pardon for having placed his foot on mine seemed perplexed to hear how much I liked it and evidently thought my friends were culpable in allowing me to be at large. This is whole scrapbook with newspaper cuttings on the show. 2,000 came to that first one. The next year it was 8,000. The Royal National Rose Society was formed in 1876 and at one point had 100,000 members. The American Rose Society was formed in 1892 and two years later Hole travelled to the States for a lecture tour. Hole's A Book About Roses was an instant hit. By the time he died in 1901 it had reached its 19th edition. It was published in New York as well as London and there was a German edition too. This is my copy. So we've got the Chinese roses coming in, bringing new colours, smells and repeat flowering. Gardeners are now going mad about roses. But rose breeders, just like Dupont, were still relying on the bees and luck to discover new varieties of rose. They weren't crossing roses selectively. It took another Englishman to lead the way. Henry Bennett was a cattle farmer who knew all about selective breeding in cattle. In 1865, he saw how popular roses were becoming. He saw how unprofitable agriculture was becoming and decided the future lay in rose breeding. He went to France to see how the breeders there were raising new roses and was shocked. Most were still leaving the job of pollination to the bees and the wind. Using his farming knowledge, he began advocating selective breeding, deliberately crossing the pollen from one rose to another. Bennett knew what he was doing and did create some great roses for the time. This is perhaps his best, Mrs John Lang. But he upset Re Reynolds Hole and all the vicar bigwigs at the Royal National Rose Society who considered him commercial and vulgar. Don't want to be rude here, but of course Americans like a brash salesman. In 1880, he sold exclusive rights to one of his roses in the States, a new hybrid tea called William Francis Bennett for $5,000, and that is a lot of money in those days. It was a rare financial success for Bennett, who struggled and ended up resentful and alcoholic. He died in 1890, but he had shown the way. Now rose breeders were breeding selectively. Roses were getting better and better, and demand was growing. In particular, the hybrid teas were taking off. These were considered the best roses for showing. There was still one more problem. As Henry Bennett found out, you don't make much money breeding roses. 
typically a guinea in the first year, but then all your competitors start taking cuttings. Before long, they're selling for a few cents. In the 1920s, that was to change. And I like to think this is one of the reasons why. One of the most bizarre camping trips in history. In 1915, Thomas Edison here, who was 80, 68 at the time, 68, along with his friends, the car maker Henry Ford, tyre manufacturer Harvey Firestone, and the naturalist John Burroughs, decided to go on holiday together. They undertook to live under canvas and cheerfully endure wet, cold smoke, mosquitoes, black flies, and sleepless nights, just to touch naked reality once more. Sorry about that accent, it was terrible. The vagabonds, as they called themselves, were not exactly slumming it. Newspaper photos show them sitting at a camp table in formal shirts and ties, waited on by a butler. Their entourage on some of these trips stretched to as many as 50 chauffeured vehicles, all Fords with Firestone tyres, of course. The vagabonds did nine of these holidays. On his first adventure, they visited the great Californian American plant breeder, Luther Burbank. Burbank was famous for having developed more than 800 new plant varieties. He was comfortably well off, largely due to an early inheritance, but none of his discoveries could be patented. To Edison, who over his lifetime accumulated 2,332 patents worldwide for his inventions, this was a nonsensical way to do business. I like to picture them when the sun's gone down, sitting under the stars, the women have retreated to the withdrawing tent. The guys have loosened those dicky bows and poured themselves a postprandial whiskey. And that's when Edison has a light bulb moment. In 1927, Edison, Ford and Firestone launched a joint business venture, the Edison Botanic Research Corporation. It was supposed to be looking for alternative sources of rubber in US plants. With a legitimate business interest in his, of his own now at stake, Thomas Edison joined those lobbying for a change in the patent law. In May 1930, his efforts were rewarded when Herbert Hoover signed the US Plant Patent Act. The act gave the holder of the patent exclusive rights for 17 years. In 1931, the world's first plant was patented. It was a rose, a repeat flowering sport of Dr. Van Fleet. It was called New Dawn. Three decades later, Britain passed similar patenting legislation. Breeding and marketing new varieties of roses on the scale that modern breeders do can be hugely expensive. Financing that without the benefit of protection would be impossible. And so, rosarians of the world owe Americans a debt of gratitude for that innovative legislation. And I'd like to say thanks in particular to America for New Dawn, which is one of my favorite roses pictured here in my garden. So there we are. We have the four Ps, plants, process, passion and patents, all our problems sorted. Not quite. There was one more problem. With all these new roses coming in and particularly the hybrid teas with their gaudy oranges, yellows and reds and big blooms, roses that could be cut and exhibited at rose shows, the often subtler older roses, many of which flowered just once, began to go out of fashion. They were being lost. A movement began to save them. Heritage rose societies around the world still strive to rescue old roses, and they've come back into fashion as tastes in gardening have changed. The World Federation of Rose Societies has a digital magazine devoted just to heritage roses. I have the honor of editing it with Charles here. By any other name comes out twice a year and is free to American Rose Society members. So take a note of the simple links here and have a look. But I think this is a good point for my tag partner, Charles, to climb into the ring and for me to step aside. He's going to explore some of the difficult questions about rose preservation. Is it worth saving old roses? If they're not repeat flowering, if they're not as floriferous as modern roses, if they can't survive without spraying. I've talked about the history of the rose, Charles is going to talk about the place of historic roses in the modern garden. Over to you, Charles. Yeah, I'm just trying to work out how to do it. 
Go ahead, share your PowerPoint, Charles. You're the presenter. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. <clears throat> so the first question I've got for you, because there's more questions than answers, is which roses are better, old ones or new ones? Charles, we haven't got your slides yet. That should be up. Is it there? Got it. Can yeah. you see anything? Yes. Yep, we can what see can them now. See? What can you see? Uh, the pretty bowl with all the blooms in it. Good, fine. But I would say you should never ask the question which are better, the old roses or the new better uh, roses. They're all beautiful. It's what, but it's rather like saying um, which are better, oranges or apples. And, and the answer is they're different. Uh, and I like them all. And you shouldn't compare them. You should just enjoy them. And this picture is a, is a mixture. Let me show you some old roses. These are damask roses from my own garden, and every one you can see has a different shape. Uh, and you don't get that sort of variation of shape among, among modern roses, among um, hybrid teas. And I would also say about the damask roses that each of them has a, an amazing sweet smell. This is an old Gallico rose. It's a found rose. We don't know its real name. That's why the name is there in double quotes. But what I would say is you don't get that combination of color and shape in modern roses. This is a moss rose. It's a super mossy one. Can, I hope you can see the um, sepals uh, on the buds in the background. Um, Ralph Moore, um, tried to breed them into his miniatures, but they never really became main line. But uh, wouldn't you, I mean, I would love to see that on, on Floribundas. And it's worth knowing that if you actually rub the mossiness on a rose, you'll find that it smells of pine trees. And what about a yellow rose that never fades? All modern yellows fade in sunlight. Think of Julia Child. Lovely rose, lovely lady, lovely cook, lovely film, but boy, doesn't it fade. And what about Graham Thomas? Lovely rose, lovely man, a great friend of ours, but his roses or, or, or his Yellow rose never keeps its color. But Rosa fetida, that wild rose, which comes from uh, Eastern Europe and, and parts of Central Asia, that is pure yellowness. Absolutely no sign of the color fading. There you are. Wouldn't that look good in your garden? Especially in Texas. Now that's Martin Stott, and I must tell you that when I was talking to him recently, he made some very rude remarks about old roses. That's what he said. They don't repeat. They're not healthy, and and they they don't have enough flowers. Well, he's absolutely wrong in all those allegations. Who says? Who says that old roses only flower once? Some of them never stop flowering. Who, who complains that your red buds flower only once? They're lovely, but they only last three or four weeks. And what, what about your dogwoods? Do Virginians think that their beautiful state flower should last all summer? Certainly not. That's ridiculous. Some of the best roses flower only once. That's just a batch of hybrid seedlings of damask roses from my garden. And some of them, some of them have amazing hips. That's a rugosa. Yes, amazing hips. So what's the next calumny that Martin casts upon old roses? 
he says they get disease, that they can't survive without being sprayed. Yeah, he's true. I mean, the, there are some old roses that get old roses, and so do modern roses like David Austin's. This picture actually is from the website of Jackson and Perkins, who sell mainly modern roses. And do you remember a rose called Tropicana? Some of you who are almost as old as I am will remember this as it was the wonder rose of the 1960s. Um, it had everything. It had perfume, vigor, this amazing color, and great good health. And then suddenly, one summer, it became one of the great um, exponents of the beauty of mildew. But this is actually a common sequence. Um, a rose is introduced as being remarkably healthy, and then it suddenly succumbs to a new form of an old fungus. I should say microfungus. And climate doesn't help. So if you think it's smart to live in Seattle, and I know a lot of people do, don't blame the roses if they get mildew. Blame the climate. Move to Arizona instead. A dry climate means no black spot, no mildew, no rust. So that's dealt with the question of, of bad health, of having to spray them. The last objection which, which he had was that they're not floriferous. Old roses don't flower as regularly or as well as modern ones. Well, that's the red rose of Lancaster. Martin showed a picture of this, of the, um, of the rose. Uh, it's a place called Kipsgate, which is a good garden to visit for roses. Um, but is it unfloriferous? Like heck, it's very, very showy when it flowers in high summer in the UK. And look, on the, look at the buds on it. It's a rose, a rose that dates back certainly to medieval times. It's one of the first varieties that we can definitely recognize when we look at 15th century paintings. And is that, is that uh, short on flowers? Certainly not. It's a climbing form. It's a tea rose introduced that climbing form in 1858, uh, which was, I looked it up, it's the year that Minnesota was admitted as the 32nd US state. And is that old enough for you? What about this? There's no shortage of buds on Safrano, a lovely, lovely tea rose, which is still popular, I know, in parts of the southern states, um, and was once grown in its millions to supply um, your east coast cities with cut roses in winter. OK, now let's look at some modern roses. Royal Highness, why do you Americans have this this hang up about royalty. We just take it for granted. Anyway, the Royal Highness is an American rose, but a bad repeater. I took this photograph in Balboa Park in San Diego in April a few years ago, and it won't reflower now for three, three and a half months. It was bred to win prizes at spring shows. It's very elegant, but it's a useless garden rose. Let's get closer to home. This is Gertrude Jekyll, a lovely rose, flowering in the south of France. But one of the troubles or the weaknesses with um, David Austin's roses is that they take too much time before reflowering. Why do we grow them? Because they're worth it, they're lovely. And if you have a big garden, you don't expect every rose to be in flower all the time and you plant lots and lots of different ones. So, these old roses have history. 
is one dates to 1540-ish, before the United States were invented. This is a sport of the White Rose of York. The Wars of the Roses were in the 15th century. Okay, I know UK history is boring, but you'll find this rose in the gardens at Monticello. Does the name Thomas Jefferson mean something to you? Well, he liked it anyway, this rose. And also at Monticello, you'll find this, though actually Jefferson never saw it because although it's an old rose, uh, it was uh, not introduced from Persia uh, uh, into your gardens until the 1950s. Uh, it was a, a mistake when the gardens were last restored and replanted. But a point which I would make is that many old roses have great beauty. And many of them have a wonderful scent or fragrance, as Graham Thomas used to say. And there are fun things that turn up along the way like the moss roses that I talked about earlier. As I say, if you see a moss rose, stroke it and then smell your fingers and you'll get this smell of pine, pine needles, pine woods. And freaks, like proliferation sometimes happen. More with old roses, I find them with modern ones. It really does happen. Here's an example on, in my own garden. It's a, a Gallica rose, not a particularly good one, uh, but, but Graham Thomas gave it to me, and you can see that a, a new flower and buds are coming out of the the uh, the what appears to be the old one. And he has another one, not a good photograph. Uh, it's um, but it's one of those things that happens, and you find this sort of trouble also in modern roses. Now this is not exactly proliferation, but it is uh, an alteration to the structure of the carpel. And you find this this one actually. Um, I took this portrait. I think it's probably frost damage, but it could be something else. I took it at somewhere in downtown uh, Los Angeles. Um, and this this is even more exciting. It shows it's a modern rose, um, and it's uh, deliberately bred and chosen and selected and sold very widely. Still sells very widely in Japan. Tells you something about Japanese taste. Um, and modern hybridists like Mayon have started to copy and value these aberrations and to see what their commercial possibilities might be. But I still come back to what I believe is, in this field anyway, the old roses are the most exciting. And incidentally, I read somewhere recently that someone had had a reversion from this to um, the pink rose, which Martin showed you, which is called um, I call it old blush. What is it? Probably. Um, maiden's blush. Maidens, no, not maiden's blush. Old, old, old blush kind of Parsons. Parsons pink. Yes, sorry. My wife is helping me in the background. She knows more about everything than I do. Um, there's just so much history there. Do you still grow this rose in the US? I bet you don't. Never forget how much we all owe to the American breeders like um, Walter Van Fleet. Never forget, and Martin reminded us, that the American rose New Dawn was the first ever to be patented. That was nearly 100 years ago. Go back further still and cherish the roses bred by Samuel and John Feast in Maryland, which reminds me, um, one of my wife's ancestors signed the American Declaration of Independence, which he doesn't like to talk about it because he was a traitor to our good, George, good King George. I have one more thing to say to you. Please support the American Rose Society's garden. And then ask yourself, how many different roses grow there? I'm, I'm, can I also say what a beautiful blue sky you have? I wish we ever had blue skies in England, which we don't. Then when you've thought about the garden at Shreveport, come to Europe to see what you have lost, what we grow, which you no longer do. 
This is Bagatelle in Paris. There are about 3,000 different roses growing in this garden, which was planted by, uh, well, planted um, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, La Ile Rose is on the other side of Paris, and that has 3,500 different roses, a particularly good collection uh, here and elsewhere within the garden of rambling and climbing roses. When I say different roses, I mean different cultivars. Come and see this wonderful garden in Tuscany, in Italy. Uh, it's privately owned. It has 6,000 different roses. Come on, come and see the American roses that you have forgotten because of your passion for new got ones, the ones you have failed to conserve. And above all, please come to the great European collection at Zangerhausen in Germany. There are 9,000 different cultivars and species in this collection, including hundreds of American roses that are no longer, that you no longer grow. Come and see them, please. Please get interested in your rose heritage and stop arguing about whether old roses are better than new. All roses are beautiful. These actually are new roses. They're David Austin's bred in the last uh, 30 years. And they're lovely, aren't they? That's all. <laughs>